Perfect. Good morning. This is the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals Public Review Session for September 8th, 2014. We'll begin with the special order calendar. New cases, item number one, 30201 BZ, 2519 Creston Avenue, the Bronx. Okay, so um, I'll just start off with my comments. Um, it seems as if the CFO has uh, still not been issued after a very long time. Um, the application says that the original holdup was the expiration of the variance that has since been renewed on 2012, in 2012. Um, and the application says despite the best efforts of the architect, you still cannot get the CFO. Um, I'd like to know what the best efforts were, what the holdup is. Um, and then um, other comments that I had were the, the site is kind of a little bit unsightly. I'm just wondering whether we can, um, whether the applicant would consider improving the quality of the, the fencing um, and also the relationship between the street and the, um, between the sidewalk and that fencing. For instance, there's photographs that show that our people are hanging out there. Um, perhaps there's a way to make that more of an accommodating place for, um, for a neighborhood as opposed to just chicken wire fencing. Um, did anybody else? Mm -hmm. Hi, yes, I actually agree with you as to the condition of the site. I did do a site visit there and it seems like there's a low retaining wall that goes around underneath the fence that is slowly crumbling and I think part of the reason is most probably the tree roots. I don't know if they need to be cut back but they seem to be invading the area either underneath the wall or along the wall which is causing the bricks to start to fall out and cracks to go in so I don't know what they could do to spruce that up but I agree with you it does give a very um, unsightly appearance to the site and something needs to be done to improve that mm -hmm. anybody any other comments I have no so yeah so so just with respect to that I, I really do think that if we're talking about a renewal it's time to renew the aesthetic quality of the site and that the applicant really should make some suggestions about how they're going to do that especially because the site is across the street from a public park that has actually really nice quality fencing this should be responsive to that Item number two, 31806 BZ, 4905 Astoria Boulevard, Queens. Okay, so uh, similarly, this is an extension of a variance that was originally approved in 1957 and extended in 2007 with a lot of caveats that were imposed. Um, it sounds like none of which have been complied with to date. Uh, that includes what was imposed imposed in 2007 was um, construction of a six foot high opaque fe fencing along the rear property line, reducing the 74 foot curb cut to three 30 foot cuts, uh, six foot high screening around the restroom area with automatic door closer, fencing along the site's perimeter, removal of debris and excess vehicles, and a sign that indicates a uh, right turn on 49th Street, and to obtain a CFO within six months, and that the signage would comply with the C1 district regulations, none of which have been accomplished as far as I can tell. Um, and my opinion about this really is that the application shouldn't be considered until these changes or these requested required changes are accomplished. Um, there's an additional request about the metal storage container, which is literally a container just dropped on the site uh, that the applicant would like to retain. I don't understand why that shouldn't be a permanent structure that is something that is of the quality of the rest of the building um, as opposed to just a container so uh, they need to look at that um, I think in, in terms of the, f uh, the statement of facts and findings the application really needs to discuss why a gas station at this location today continues to be an appropriate use in the neighborhood um, and I let's see I think that's it. Yes, uh, I also did a site visit to this site and um, 
I believe that they could actually improve the site by increasing the amount of landscaping that's on the border with the residential property. Right now, I believe it's just overgrown grass. It, it would definitely benefit from having six foot hedges along that border. It would soften its border with residential, which would improve the overall area. <coughs> Um, I think that if they do, whatever they do to the signage to reduce it, they should redo the signage analysis by frontage so it would be clearer and easier for us to analyze it and make sure it is in compliance with C1. Mm -hmm. And they also um, have some ECB fines that I think they need to clear up. Um, it's not, they don't exactly uh, tell us how they're going to comply um, with, with some of their violations. And I guess they have some open jobs that they need to close on that site as well. Um, so if they can give us a some sort of structure, um, schedule of how they're going to accomplish that, that would be great. Oh, they also have some trucks parked on the site, which I'm not sure exactly why they're always there. I can understand occasionally having trucks that are serviced, but it seems that it's the same trucks no matter when you go and no matter when the photographs are taken. It's the uh, same couple of trucks. Okay. I also wanted to, to know, because no environmental review is needed for this as application, um, that there should be uh, a report to show that there are no open spills from gas tanks on this site, um, because it has been a gas station for a very long time. It's hard to believe there's no spills. No secret protocol? Item number three, 193-12BZ, 384 Lafayette Street, Manhattan. Okay, this is a, an application for a physical cultural establishment um, special permit, and I don't have any issues on this. Does anyone? Um, just two minor issues, one of which is the signage analysis. Since this building, I believe, does extend to three frontages, it would be great if they could clarify which frontage they're talking about in terms of where the signage is located. I know there are signs for other uh, retail operations also on that site. And also, are the hours going to be the same as they were in the previous grant? Mm -hmm. Appeals calendar. I'm sorry. May I go on? <laughs> sorry. Appeals calendar continued hearings. Item number four, 145.14a, 13616 Carlton Place, Queens. Uh, since our last um, hearing, the uh, applicant has revised the facts and findings, um, has given us uh, street photos, and shows how cars get to the rear of the site. Are there any other issues that are open on this that we need to discuss? No. no. New cases, item number 5, 278.13a, 121 Barrack Street, Manhattan. Uh, this is a, a case to um, an appeal to uh, legalize a, an existing sign, um, an appeal from a DOB determination that, that the sign is not uh, legal. Uh, one of the arguments that the applicant is making is that uh, the sign is located within 200 feet of uh, Broom and Watt Street, but that those are not approaches to the tunnel. Uh, to the Holland Tunnel, um, and the uh, the applicant can argues extensively that in fact there are no approaches to the tunnel. Uh, that's a little bit hard to understand because the tunnel has to have some kind of an approach. The zoning resolution describes it as the Holland Tunnel and approaches, and unless the applicant is arguing that the zoning resolution is incorrect, there's got to be something that's an approach, even if the approach arguably doesn't extend to Broome or Watt Street, there's something. There's the plaza that's the approach, there's something, and so the question is, if from whatever that approach point is, uh, isn't the sign visible from that approach point? Um, the, the question might be then, is it visible in the direction of travel or do you have to turn 360? But, but there is an exit and an entrance to the tunnel, isn't it within 200 feet of or within a distance of the, that aspect of the approach that would make, it, make the sign non-conforming with respect to size because even if it's beyond 200 feet, there's, a limitation, there's been a limitation on the size since the sign was um, first issued in 1998. So um, first, really, the applicant has to discuss 
that aspect of it to make sure that the sign was properly permitted. But then the other aspect of it is um, the Department of Buildings is arguing that the, the sign is not legal because of Rule 49, which defined what an approach is, which is a street that doesn't have an exit prior to entering into the tunnel. Um, since Rule 49 was enacted in 2005, uh, you could argue that this was uh, sort of a retroactive application of rule. So we would like to hear from DOB that um, DOB's practice prior to, to 2005, and in fact in 1998 when the permit was issued, um, was to treat approaches the way Rule 49 does. And then the other is, was to treat what is considered visible from um, 360 degrees as opposed to just the direction of travel. Anything, anything else? Nothing that covered my issues too. And mine as well. Okay, right. The zoning calendar decision items. Item number six, 297.13BZ, 308 Cooper Street, Brooklyn. This item is being deferred. Continued hearing items. Item number seven, 2-13BZ, 438 Chargy Street, Staten Island. Um, this, we've seen um, a great deal from, from this application. However, I still think that there may be some open items, um, specifically how the applicant is treating um, his triangular site and whether or not he's been able to show us um, the true, I guess, sort of as of right, what could be there and, and why it would not work, uh, as well as um, establishing that that 580 some odd square feet that we're talking about um, may, at least in my mind, might be better served if it has, if it's part of the, the original building as opposed to this sort of separate, um, smaller space. So um, I think that the applicant has to come back and, and take a look at that. I know that the chair had some questions as well. Yeah, so for me, one of them was also that um, the triangular site, um, the applicant is arguing the triangular site is a unique physical condition. Um, and there are other triangular sites in the neighborhood because of the carving on the road. If the applicant could discuss how those sites have been handled, what, what is on those sites, are they vacant, are they occupied, if occupied, how are they used, that would help to support the argument um, that the site is uh, unique. Um, and also, there are no conforming use plans, so um, how would the site be used if, the, if there was no grant? So, for example, there could be a medical office on that on, on the entire property, that would be conforming. Um, it could be residential, that could be conforming. Um, so the, the applicant really does need to look at that in order to complete the variance argument. Um, anything else? Well, I just wanted to comment that at the last hearing I had made a number of suggestions as to how to correct the financials so that they would flow clearer and those suggestions were followed. And so as regards the initial scenarios that we asked them to analyze, they did follow the instructions and it is much clearer. Mm -hmm. So I would assume going forward when they do analyze the new scenarios that you discuss, it should follow the same format. Then okay. we would be fine. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Item number eight, 264.13BZ, 257 West 17th Street, Manhattan. I think that the, uh, the commissioners still had some open questions about the, uh, the noise analysis. Um, I know specifically um, Commissioner Montanez had expressed that uh, the analysis clearly showed that there was still uh, an abundance of noise above um, 45 decibels um, uh, when it came to the music. And they hadn't really explained why that is and what they were going to do about it. Um, also, I think that um, there were some questions uh, about the methodology of the, um, of the sound analysis and um, the fact that also the tenants in the building have their own acoustical person and um, we haven't really um, heard exactly why uh, that, that person hasn't um, weighed in on, on how the, uh, 
how the testing was done. So I think that there's, there's still some open issues concerning what can be done and mitigating um, some of the, the circumstances. Um, mm -hmm. Chair? Um, I just, just to reinforce that, it's uh, that the, the, the acoustical tests were done at such an odd time, it was kind of like between classes, the 10 minutes when there's no class, no music, that's when the acoustical test was done using one weight lifter and one piece of music playing and no instructor shouting whatever they shout at weight lifters while they're weight lifting. And so um, the testing must be done during class time while there's an instructor, while there's music, otherwise it doesn't at all test the, the vibrations, the reality of the sound, et cetera. Um, the applicant really does need to take this seriously. It's a, it's a big problem, apparently. Well, also, um, I find it really concerning that even with those tests, it doesn't seem to address the issue of the vibrations, which I think are probably more disturbing than the sound even, because vibrations actually get into your system and can actually make you sick. So I think that, you know, in the previous hearing, they were talking about all of these, like, little portable solutions that they had devised, like carrying mats over just for the weightlifting. And it seems as if even from the limited testing they did, that is not sufficient in eliminating the vibration. So perhaps they need to look at a more permanent solution. And then if they want to, you know, after you have some sort of spring form floor or heavy matting, if you want to then add some more portable matting on top, that's even better. But I think at this point, they need to look at something that is permanently in place all the time. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Thank you. Next. Item number 9, 271 13BZ, 129 Norfolk, Stroke, Norfolk Street, Brooklyn. Uh, I think that the commissioners um, continue to have some questions. Uh, at our last hearing, um, I particularly had asked the question of why we could not see a complying five foot side yard, and the applicant came back and told us that structurally it would be um, very difficult. However, I would note that the original wall is shown at three foot nine inches um, uh, from the property line, and their new wall is shown at four foot three inches from the property line, which begs a question, if you can give me four foot three inches, why can't you give me five feet? Um, I think they're clearly demolishing that wall, and um, I would like them to to show us the five-foot solution. I also know that the chair had additional comments um, concerning reduction of bulk and, and the floor area. Right, so uh, the, the first thing about this is that, the, uh, that this building, because of its proximity to the waterfront, um, really does, it needs to comply with floodplain regulations and it has to be lifted off the ground um, by nine feet. Um, that brings up two issues. Um, one is that uh, zoning resolution section 6461 allows a higher base plane of nine feet, which is what that would be when you lift it. Um, when two mitigating elements are employed to reduce the impact of the first floor, the impact on the street of the first floor, uh, they provided so far in the revised plans one mitigating element, which was the slope on the site. Um, but they're missing a second one. The second one is either a porch or a stair that turns. Um, so the applicant has, has to revise a plan to show that. The, um, the second issue that it brings up, which, is a, which must be dealt with in the application, is that um, this special permit is actually for enlargements. And enlargement uh, only works if you've got the existing floor area in the building, at least 25% of the existing floor area retained in the building. In this case, the only thing that is actually being retained is the cellar, um, which is being the foundations of the cellar, which are being filled, and the entire building is being lifted. So this is a un very unusual circumstance, and the applicant has to, be, has to distinguish this unusual circumstance from uh, a complete teardown, and we haven't dealt with this kind of thing before. We need to um, be sure that we're not creating an undue precedent about a teardown. Uh, and the fact is that the idea is to retain the building in 25% uh, of the building, but it's not going to be physically possible if you must lift it. So you're kind of in conflict with two sets of regulations, and the applicant really needs to address this uh, in the application materials. Um, the 
The other thing is by lifting the building up the nine feet, now the, the building becomes extremely massive and um, with respect to its neighbors. So in ex essentially in order for us to grant a special permit here, they're, they're with where we have the authority to require certain kinds of safeguards so that it's consistent with neighborhood character. In this case, the attic it is only permitted to be have a floor area equal to one third of the floor below in order not to count as a floor, right? So, um, but what we see on the drawings is that the balance of the attic is massive and is being used as kind of empty space. What I, what I would like to see is that the attic, the portion of the attic that is not being used for bedrooms and related facility should be eliminated so it reduces the apparent, apparent mass of the building and keeps it more in keeping with uh, the neighborhood character. Um, in this case, I also want to point out which the, which the applicant should discuss. Uh, there's a request to reduce the depth of the rear yard to 20 feet, which is uh, something that's permitted under the special permit. The reason that this is something that could be considered in this case is because the, the site backs onto an eight-foot sewer easement, so effectively you'd be getting a 28-foot rear yard. Um, that, is, that should go into the findings, into the discussion about why this is um, appropriate to neighborhood character. Anybody else? No. Thanks. Item number 10, 32713BZ, 1504 Coney Island Avenue, Brooklyn. Um, I think that uh, we still had some questions um, on, on this project. Um, and uh, I think that the, the chair had some questions in, concerning the, the assumptions made in the parking study mm -hmm. um, specifically, and, and I know um, Commissioner Otley Brown had had some um, issues concerning concerning parking, but I think that we are looking in terms of how this facility still uh, can accommodate the the amount of parking that um, is required. Uh, and I don't know if the applicant has really made his case that the reduction um, would be um, you know would be fine in this case, considering that pomegranate is across the street and we have so much, um, so much intensity of, of traffic. Um, so, um, so and just to, to pick continue. up from there, the, the uh, submission uh, includes um, tear sheets from the manufacturer of the stackers, and it has a plan, a floor plan, showing the stackers in place, but it doesn't give us any information about how many spaces there are being provided at each stacker level, and it doesn't also provide any information about what the floor-to-floor -floor height is for each collected stacker level. So for example, if there are two stacker levels, we, we actually don't know, then what's the floor-to-floor -floor height requirement for two stacker levels compared to the amount of excavation that's being proposed? How much more excavation would there need to be for three stacker levels, for example? Um, and then with respect to the EAS, the, the EAS argues that there will be 70 empty spaces at peak hours during the operation of the ambulatory care center. Um, and it assumes that those 70 empty spaces will be made available effectively to the pomegranate store across the street to alleviate the traffic congestion caused by it. However, we don't really have anything to support this claim of 70 spaces. And the applicant refers to an EAS um, that uh, connected with a BSA variance in 2011 at 6010 Bay Parkway. Um, that's certainly long enough ago where the, that number of spaces could be checked. Um, and so does 6010 Bay Parkway, in fact, at peak hours, have equivalent percentages of empty spaces? Uh, we need to see that. Um, and then also, the applicant claims that there's adequate spaces for the retail space that will be provided on this, in this facility why won't that have the same kind of traffic impact as pomegranate? So we'd like to know, first of all, how many spaces does pomegranate have? Do, do those space counts comply with current zoning? And if not, 
by how much. Um, and with respect to the department store and the other retail, shouldn't we be assuming that those those stores are just as successful as pomegranate? That would be fantastic. Uh, however, in that case, then those 70 spaces would likely be occupied by the new retailers. So we would also like you to the applicant to establish that a department store of the same type as planned also has excess spaces somewhere else in the neighborhood. Uh, there probably are a lot of examples where you can easily do a peak hour, peak demand uh, parking count. Anybody else? Um, I, I actually agree with you on that point in terms of trying to figure out exactly how many spaces the use group 10 and the other retail would use. And in the neighborhood, I believe you do have a few large stores, like I believe there's a TJ Maxx or a Marshalls within like a half a mile of this site that has a parking lot. So it actually is something that you can get information about. That would be helpful to let us know whether or not the required amount of spaces at this site for those uses would actually be um, more than containing the parking demand. In the last hearing, I did ask the question as to how the demand was determined to be 198 spaces, and that's when they first went into how they were looking at the 6010 Bay Parkway, but you're absolutely right. They don't really exactly explain whether or not they assumed correctly when they determined how many spaces were actually needed based on the demand that they projected in that site when they first built it. So it would be great to take another look and see if they were actually accurate assumptions and whether they could take those assumptions and apply it here. Great. Okay. Thank you. Item number 11, 1714 BZ, 600 McDonald Avenue, Brooklyn. Uh, I think that the commissioners had um, several um, outstanding questions here, um, not least of which is sort of the presence of this very massive wall, rear wall, um, and its presence. It's 600 feet long, it's about 70 feet high, and although the applicant has said that they will mitigate that by making this sort of, I guess, have um, sort of decorative block and, um, and brick, um, it, it still is quite um, quite an imposition. And although the, um, the applicant has shown us uh, schools in the area that are perhaps as tall as this is going to be, um, I don't think that um, the schools that, that, that they've shown us um, are sort of comparable in terms of, you know, apples and oranges. This is a very long, large building and is very massive. The ones that they've shown us are um, uh, you know, quite decorative and of a time and period in which um, schools of this, this type were of a great stature in the community and they're sort of edifices that, that one can look at and say, ah, yes, this is, and they're, they're well sited and uh, they've got um, uh, a lot of land around them. And, and it, so it's, it's not quite the same. Um, it, as a matter of fact, it's not the same at all. So I, I troubled that um, we still sort of have this mass here. Um, I know that, that um, Commissioner Montanez also shared, um, shared this with me. She also shared that um, she was concerned about the structural integrity of the building. Um, on her site visit, she um, noticed that there had been horizontal cracking already in the structure and that um, an additional two stories um, was perhaps problematic and would like that addressed um, as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I wanted to pick up on the aesthetics of this, uh, the, the, the tradition of school building in the early 20th century was to make schools something very grand about which you could be proud. Instead, what's proposed here is a temporary, very poor quality structure that is extremely long um, and um, really, really of kind of questionable neighborhood um, let's say benefit in terms of its aesthetics. So, and um, it's very, it's actually hard to understand why from a programmatic perspective uh, this building needs to be one long building when you're talking about a lower school, middle school, and a high school. Um, more typically if you were doing a better design here, which is something that uh, is something that we can 
require as part of the variance uh, approval um, in order to comply with neighborhood character, this really should be a building that's broken up into parts so that you're not reading it as one gigantic wall. Um, the other is that uh, in addition to which it's much taller than its neighbors, so something to mitigate that the height with respect to the neighbors, something to address the blank wall that's directed to the neighbors, and also that extremely strange um, covered play area uh, where you have two stories on top of a two-story open place on, on columns. Um, I'm not even sure that that's permitted for play areas for students. I understood that they had to be, the play areas had to be open to the sky. So that actually needs to be clarified. Um, in New York City, many schools have playgrounds on the roof and no playground at grade. So I'm not seeing that, that a playground at grade is actually needed here. Um, in addition to which, um, um, this is one of the two kitchens, yes. right? Yeah. In addition to which there are two kitchens, which we understand the purpose of for kosher cooking. However, we want to be, want to clarify that this is a school and it's not a catering facility and we need the applicant to state affirmatively that it will not be a catering, catering facility and that that will actually appear on the certificate of occupancy. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I fully agree with you as to the catering. It really wasn't addressed here, only a definition or a, a, a an explanation as to why there were two kitchens, but it, there were allegations that there were cater, there was catering here, and that actually changes the use on the site, and that increases the intensity of use on the site. And so that would be something that we would want to know about, and it certainly would not be appropriate here. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you. Right, it would go to the parking requirements. It would go to a lot of things. Yeah. Uh -huh. New cases, item number 12, 343-12BZ, 570 East 21st Street, Brooklyn. <clears throat> okay, uh, this, is, this is an interesting application for a variance for a school um, for uh, what are termed medically frail children. Um, the, the, it's a, a little bit confusing to us because, because it's a, a typology that we're not familiar with. Um, we, what is normal and what we need from the applicant is an expert report from a facilities programmer explaining what this, what type of school this is, what the needs are for a school like this, um, how many classrooms would be required for a student population, and um, and and what is typical if this is to be a. a effectively a dormitory facility. Um, we're not a aware of similar institutions um, and so we need examples of similar facilities that in that handle uh, the, the teaching of children with these kinds of needs similarly. Um, we also had questions in terms of the plans because uh, though there are sleeping accommodations for the children. We see no sleeping quarters at all for the caregivers, and since the children are obviously there 24 hours, where are the caregivers? Um, there's actually no place even for the caregivers to sort of just be, to hang out, even if they're on shifts. Um, there's also no cooking facilities. Um, if, if food is coming from off-site, then where is it prepped? Uh, there's actually no indication that these children will be fed, frankly. So uh, we do need to see a much more descriptive programmatic analysis. It needs to come from an expert, not from the applicant um, or the developer of this project. Agreed. I just had an additional question uh, that I would love clarified in terms of the transportation of the day students and how they'll arrive at the school. Which site are they going to arrive to or which entrance, the one on Ocean or the one on 21st? Because when you go to the site and you look at 21st, which is where the entry to the garage is, that's a very narrow street and I actually got blocked in on that street just stopping to look. So if, if there is going to be double parked cars that are backed up, it's going to pose a problem and an unsafe problem because inevitably what people are going to do is they're going to get stuck and they're going to back down a one-way street and that, you know, that could cause a catastrophe in terms of other people moving around in that area. Um, will they be 
taking away some of the parking spaces and make it into no standing so that that at least would facilitate loading and unloading on either of the frontages. So it would be great if they could detail that for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to echo a little bit about um, what Commissioner Otley Brown has said, I had a concern about sort of how operationally um, children are, are brought to the site and um, dropped off, whether we're talking about purely buses or is this ambulettes. Um, it's not really um, clear to me. Um, also, uh, I know that that sort of that backup on 21st Street, because I experienced it as well, there's, I believe that there is a curb cut that's adjacent to the curb cut that they're proposing. So I'm wondering, does that go into the adjacent apartment building? And will do they have to also consider sort of traffic going in and out um, of that building as well? Uh, and it, it seems to me that um, if everyone is, is going to load and offload on 21st, that they're really creating kind of a bottleneck situation. And maybe they need to perhaps think of maybe um, loading and offloading maybe the day students on Ocean and, and then reserving the 21st Street side for faculty and, and um, uh, sort of other cars that, that might have a longer stay. So. Um, if they could exp uh, go into that, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Next item, item number 13, 8-14 BZ, 1824 East 22nd Street, Brooklyn. Okay, um, so this is a special permit um, for the enlargement of a single family home in the Sheepshead Bay area. Um, the application materials really do need to be beefed up uh, to establish that the findings have been met. Uh, there needs to be an area study that shows how the, the proposed massing is in character with the neighborhood and how the proposed 20-foot rear yard um, will impact the neighbors uh, and the interior, what's known as the donut. Um, there should be an area map uh, that shows what buildings have more than one FAR, what buildings have 20-foot rear yards, um, which are built with two stories and an attic and cover more than 47% or 47% of lot coverage, and which ones of those received BSA waivers, um, that the map should be clear, which sites received what kinds of waivers. The only ones that should be included must be permitted um, so they can't be, uh, they have to have received DOB permits in order to make these enlargements. Um, and then in, in general, um, in terms of the mass of the house, this is an extremely large house on the site. And so in order to um, make it more in character with its neighbors, it's, it's extremely tall. So it needs to be brought down in terms of the mass. And again, as I mentioned on the other, um, the attic again is um, is filled with there. There one third of the area of the attic is occupied, but the rest of it is not occupied, and that should be eliminated from the mass of the building. Uh, in addition to which, um, this the 20 foot rear yard seems to be unnecessary in this case, given the planning, the layout of the house where there is um, what's known as a library between the living room and the dining room area, so it sort of pushes out the length of the building unnecessarily. And there's also an ante room and a his and her wardrobe between the master bedroom and the other bedrooms, which again pushes the house out longer. If those were eliminated, you wouldn't need so much of a reduction on the required rear yard. Um, the applicant should look at that. Um, at modifying the house in that way. Um, and I think that's it. Okay. Um, just a, a couple of points. Uh, they, the architect has made a notation that the garage is under separate application. They should also just simply add that um, DOB needs to approve that garage. And, and then I also had a question about they have a separate parking space in the side yard, and it doesn't appear that one would be able to sort of access how, how does that work? But is, is it two spots, or are they just saying that, that they have a garage and they have, you know, maybe a single spot? But they've also got access from that side yard into the house, so it's unclear whether you can sort of have two cars or a car and get into the house at the same time. It's just, it's very tight. And I think that they need to show landscaping compliance. I don't think they've done mm -hmm. that, so. 
Those are just my comments. Mm -hmm. Item number 14, 2114 BZ, 11502 Jamaica Avenue. Oops. Sorry. Uh, okay, this one is an application also for a special permit for um, a crunch um, sports facility. And um, my only comments are that the application needs to be much clearer that the proposed use will be surrounded by existing commercial uses in order to support the finding that the essential character of the surrounding area will not be impaired. And the other is to include an analysis of why uh, there is no impact on the neighborhood if, if Crunch has a membership of four to 6,000 members who will be making between 500 and 750 daily visits. That's a lot of daily visits. Um, so the applicant really does need to discuss how that will affect or not affect the neighborhood character. Any other? Uh, just a clarification. Could they tell us whether or not there will be massage rooms on the second floor? It appears in the plans that there will, and then they should just address it by saying they'll have licensed masseuse. Mm -hmm. Item number 15, 60, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Item number 15, 6414 BZ, 1320 East 23rd Street, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, this is again an, an application to enlarge uh, an existing house in the Sheepshead Bay area under a special permit. Um, and for essentially the same kind of comments as earlier, um, we need an area study that shows how the massing of the proposed house is in character with the neighborhood. Uh, show the impact of the 20-foot rear yard on neighbors in the donuts and why a 20-foot rear yard would be okay. Um, show locations on an area map that indicate that there are other houses in the area that have one, more than one FAR, 20-foot rear yards, et cetera, and indicate whether those received BSA waivers. Uh, again, those sites must be sites that were built pursuant to Department of Building permits. Um, and again, with respect to the mass of the house, uh, the mass of the, of the attic level needs to be brought down to just include the portion of the attic that's occupied. Uh, and I'd like also the applicant to talk about the plan for parking here because the side yard is very reduced. How is that car actually being there? <laughs> Uh, just a, a couple of things. If they can provide the standard DOB notes concerning porches on all of the drawings, that would be helpful. And explain um, if there's been any illegal construction and the violations that exist. Um, they, do, I don't believe they gave us a survey, so um, that would be helpful. And there seems to be a discrepancy about 200 square feet in their calculation um, from their statement to actually what appears um, on their drawings and I'm wondering if, is that the elevator and are they they making that some sort of mechanical deduction um, so if they could explain that 200 square foot difference that would be very helpful okay. no question no. item right number 16 12314 BZ 855 Marie in America is Manhattan okay I, this is a special permit for a physical culture establishment I didn't have any comments uh, just if, if they're going to have massage, I don't think we got any licenses from them, or no. if they are going to have that, it wasn't clear. Okay. Anything? No additional comments from me. Okay. Item number 17, 14414 BZ, 1751 Park Avenue, Manhattan. Okay, this is uh, an application for a special permit to allow a school in an M14 zoning district. Um, the It's a an existing four-story building and the proposal is to put the school on the second floor. Um, the, there are two issues that, that I really saw. Um, one is about noise attenuation. The um, noise analysis, the, the sites right opposite the elevated of the Metro North Railway, needless to say quite a busy location um, and noisy location. The noise analysis in this EAS relies on an analysis done in 2010 for um, a city planning special permit uh, where the noise monitoring, monitoring was done on the exterior of the building instead of on the interior and, um, and then 
then the anticipated attenuation from the building was factored, it factored into the analysis. Um, that makes no sense given that the building is existing, so there should be noise monitoring on the interior of the building. Um, the other issue, which is quite a significant one, is that the third and fourth floors of the building are occupied by Bailey House, which is um, a, a not-for-profit service provider for HIV positive patients who include the mentally ill, formerly incarcerated substance abusers and they provide a food pantry and the question really is since they share the lobby and the elevators how how are the children going to be separated from these users who are in a completely different perhaps even a compromised position exposed to children that's a, a big concern and the applicant really needs to address that uh, no, just to, to echo, echo that concern, um, it appears that all entries and exits throughout the building um, can be accessed from all floors, and I think that they need to show us some sort of separation plan, um, an operational plan that shows how the children actually enter the building, how they're kept um, in a safe manner within the building. Um, some you know, children wander, as we've seen. And, um, so uh, I, I really would like to see some safeguard or at least some plan that shows us uh, what safeguards would be in place. Okay, this concludes the executive session for September 8, 2014. Thank you.